This is Cyprus, a jewel in the Med. Over four million tourists visit here every year, many of them Brits, who come here to party or to wind down on miles and miles of golden beaches. This was my first experience of Cyprus, Ayanapa, party town. I was 18 years old. Little did I realize then that just 10 miles away is an active war zone. A brutal war between Greek and Turkish Cypriots in the 1970s displaced 40% of its population forever. Refugees now scattered across the globe. <laughs> I want to meet these people who once lived happily side by side. I have been shot. You were shot by the Greeks? Yes. I thought they would kill my children. And see what now remains of the life they were forced to leave behind. The owner of this had to up sticks and just flee. To unravel this mystery, I need to explore the buffer zone, the only active demilitarized zone in Europe, a no man's land that's left vast areas of this beautiful island deserted. Both sides have got weapons, so just make sure you stay close by. It's kept Greek Cypriots in the south and Turkish Cypriots in the north apart now for almost half a century. The man behind us is not happy. There are tensions on the island. If the UN wasn't here, we could see escalation between the sides. I'm hoping I'm going to be able to hear both sides, the Greek and the Turkish Cypriots, and maybe piece together why this island is divided down the middle. To understand why this beautiful island is at war, I need to leave Ayanapa and head northeast to explore in and around the buffer zone, a no man's land that's used to divide the communities here. Hi there, how are you? Hi, I'm fine. Please. Nice to meet you. Me too. Can we go to the buffer zone, please? Thank you. Savas, a Greek Cypriot, has first hand experience of the conflict that created the buffer zone. How old were you when it all started? Uh, I was 11. I saw soldiers in the middle of the street, Turkish soldiers. Our families, uh, we ran actually up to the mountains. Was it scary? Yeah, a lot, a lot. It was unbelievable. The so-called Cyprus problem started in 1960, when it gained its independence from Britain. <laughs> Greek and Turkish Cypriots then agreed to share power. But soon, both sides began pushing their own nationalist agendas. Violent sectarianism erupted, culminating in a Greek coup, which led to the Turkish invasion of the island in July 1974. conflict claimed the lives of thousands and it made refugees of an estimated 40% of its citizens forever. <laughs> the UN then brokered a ceasefire and to keep the warring sides apart created a buffer zone that expanded along a green line dividing the island in two and it's tragically remained the same ever since. Point over here, you can see we are very close to the green line. That's the green line, just there. Yeah. Cyprus is now divided into the Republic of Cyprus, the Greek Cypriot southern part, and the Turkish Cypriot controlled north. Both are separated by the buffer zone, which is almost three times the size of Liverpool, stretching across the island, east to west, and cutting right through Nicosia city itself. Savas is taking me to a lookout point high above Nicosia City, with the zone right below us. 
Oh, what a view. This gives me a really good perspective of this divided island. In the distance, very obviously, is the Turkish Cypriot control part. You can see the flag on the mountain. And then this side, where I am now, which is Greek Cyprus. And then this whole area between the houses on this side and the other side, all the land here, is the green zone. So this is the buffer zone, the green line. There's many different terms for it. But essentially it's a dividing line that twists and turns rather chaotically through the city. You can just make out some of the abandoned bits just from here and the busy city parts surrounding them. But this is Nicosia, this is the capital of Cyprus. This is a divided city. In 2022, it's bizarre. What has kept this island divided for the best part of half a century? It, emotions must run pretty deep here. The buffer zone is a demilitarized zone that the UN uses to keep the warring armed forces on either side of it apart. There are 40,000 Turkish and Turkish Cypriot, as well as 15,000 Greek and Greek Cypriot soldiers here on the island right now. There's barbed wire and watchtowers everywhere, anti-tank ditches, minefields. It really feels like I'm walking into a war zone. To enter the buffer zone for the first time, I need to pass through this Argentine-controlled UN checkpoint, which is on the Greek side of Nicosia City. I'm so privileged to have access here. So few people have ever seen the buffer zone. This is controlled by the United Nations. Hola, ¿qué tal? Hola. Buenos días. Buenos días, yeah. Okay, let me check, please. Okay. I must surrender my passport. Typically, only UN personnel are ever allowed in the buffer zone. This is your pass. Okay, thank you. Left in my passport. <laughs> thank you. This derelict uh, petrol station. This is a world away from the Cyprus that I've just come from. It feels like um, I've stepped into a parallel world, to be quite honest. This is the no man's land area in and around Nicosia International Airport, which the UN were forced to seal off inside the buffer zone after it became a battleground. It stood abandoned now for almost half a century. Wow. I've never seen a deserted airport. The scale of it. It's quite brutal, the architecture, but strangely beautiful. West German architects Dorsch and Grumann were commissioned by the Cypriot government to build a bold, modernist airport that would symbolize the nation's hopes for the future and compete with its Mediterranean neighbors as a glamorous tourist hub. Air travel in the late 60s was prohibitively expensive. It became a status symbol for the rich and famous. Cyprus offered an English-speaking destination with year-round sunshine and golden beaches. It soon attracted the likes of supermodels and movie stars, and they all flew into Nicosia Airport. This was once the main hub into Cyprus. This was the main airport, and now there's nothing. Opened in 1968, it was an overnight success, with 800,000 passengers passing through here in 1973. Within a year, it would be sealed off forever inside the buffer zone, forbidden for anyone to enter. Cyprus Airways pilot Adamos worked here in its heyday. Adamos? I'm Ben. 
Hello, Ben. Nice to meet wow, you. I feel like I've stepped back in time. Yeah. I'm trying to imagine what this would have been like in the 60s. This would have been a hive of activity. He was buzzing with people. Whoa. The UN has granted us special permission to explore here. It's been strictly off-limits to any civilians since the war, including Adamos. How sad to see my second home like this. So this is Departures Lounge oh through here. Oh my God. Man, this is unbelievable. I cannot believe the state of this. Oh, a fig tree has grown there. Shame, but what can you do? Adamos frequently flew British tourists to and from the UK. Am I right in thinking you were the last pilot to fly into this airport? That's right. What are your memories of, of the journey leading up to that? We arrived in London early evening, turned the TV on. I could see the Turkish F-104s being loaded with bombs. The Turkish ships were being loaded with soldiers and tanks. I called the general manager in Cyprus and I asked him to cancel the flight. And categorically he said to me, no. You now know that you're potentially flying into a war zone. Absolutely. The Trident oh. aircraft I, I was in command of could carry 105 passengers. We flew over Italy, then Greece, with the Turkish coast on the left, all the way along. And then the radar started uh, showing dots. These were large ships. I counted 21 ships. So you're the first person to alert Cyprus that an invasion has started? That is correct, yes. Wow. After landing his plane, Adamos was confronted by a harrowing sight. I saw five, six fighters dropping bombs uh, left, right and center. demolished the Greek camp. They dropped bombs, huh? Yeah, they wiped it completely. They were in their sleep. And I could see Turkish aircraft dropping paratroopers, one after the other. What sort of time is this? 5.15. Because here, we started waking up now. The Turkish had begun a three-pronged invasion. By sea, by air with paratroopers, and landing wave upon wave of Bell Huey helicopters behind Greek lines. The airport soon became a battleground and a prize to be had for both sides. The war that exploded after a decade of hostility lasted just two days. But then, on August 14th, after agreeing to an initial ceasefire, Turkey started a second offensive, eventually capturing 37% of the island. The entire conflict killed thousands, and at least 2,000 people are still missing in action. Many buried where they fell, somewhere out there in the buffer zone. I think one of the great tragedies is that this airport was offering huge economic opportunity to all the islanders, both Turkish and Greek Cypriots. I think the most striking thing for me is the speed that everything happened. People knew something was likely to happen, but they didn't think it would happen as swiftly as it did. Both sides then agreed to a ceasefire and the buffer zone that now expanded right through the heart of the island, effectively dividing the capital city of Nicosia and the entire country in two. Literally overnight, this became 
the centre of the buffer zone and the airport closed and that is and was it. And it must be hard for the islanders to see this from a distance. What was once the pride of Cyprus. How does it feel to have your country invaded? Painful, very painful, because this is my country. I have been around the world three or four times. There is not a better place to be. My feelings on that night coming in and see my island surrounded with Turkish ships ready to invade and never recover from that. So I knew I had to declutter my wardrobe at some point, but I'd never throw my clothes away. Luckily, I found Vinted. I can declutter my space and sell with no fees, which means I get to keep all the extra cash I make. Download the Vinted app today. If you don't wear it, sell it. At Argos, Black Friday is coming. Be ready. Claim a gift card worth up to £250 to help with your Christmas shopping when you buy a selected TV. Is that steady return driving you do lally? Look, it's back again! Stop juggling and take control with the new flash! Dust! Magnet! Now dust to a bit of Simply shake up the dust magnet's fluffy fibres to trap and lock that dust and be dust wherever it lurks without moving objects around. Done! And dusted! New flash dust magnet! The must against dust! This is the only six-pack you should be working on. Merry Christmas. OMG, what a year. Good luck deleting these. Sorry you have to share your special day with Jesus. Happy birthday. Something for me to complete your Christmas party look. Stunning. Celebrate Christmas with gift ideas for all the people who matter in life from Not On The High Street. This year, count on EE -E to make your Christmas list go further. 300 pounds further. Because when you unbox the incredible new Google Pixel 7 Pro featuring Google's most advanced Pixel camera yet, we'll also give you a 300 pound digital prepaid card to spend on your Christmas shopping. Now that's a gift that'll keep giving from the UK's best network. So count on EE -E to give you a lot more Christmas for less. But hurry, offer ends 24th of November. He had such a way of making me feel good. I felt my whole world had crumbled. It was just one of the most unbelievable stories of deception I'd ever heard. Her profile picture was on her wedding day, and her bridegroom was my husband. A Paramount Plus original, Love Rats, streaming now. <laughs> Cyprus, known for golden beaches and five-star resorts. But it's an island ravaged by war and deeply divided to this day. Today, I'm going to Nicosia City, where the buffer zone began, to go on patrol with the British UN force here, to try and understand why Nicosia remains the only divided capital city in the world. Dave. Hi, Ben. Hey, how are you? you? How are you? Sure. Welcome to Ledge Palace. Thank you very much. Wow, look at this. So this is where our tactical operations centre is. This is where we do all of our work within the buffer zone. This was quite a big hotel back in the day. Yeah, so this was uh, Nicosia's first five-star hotel. So this was the premium hotel in, in the capital. Built in 1947, the Ledra Palace was one of the most desirable hotels in the Mediterranean. But on July 21st, 1974, it became the scene of a vicious gun battle between the warring sides. Quite a shame that you see some of the damage on the walls from the bullet holes and uh, impact from rocket propelled grenades and see, stuff like that. All so. these are bullet holes, are they? Yeah. Wow. So, so this, this was at the centre of 
proper armed conflict. Yeah. The UN now use it to monitor the tens of thousands of warring soldiers that surround the buffer zone. The buffer zone in some areas can be, you know, up to five and six kilometers wide. But the, uh, we're talking these wider areas here. Exactly, yeah. The entire buffer zone is divided up into the British, Argentine and Slovakian UN sectors. Their role is to keep the peace between the combined Cypriot, Greek and Turkish armed forces. They patrol it 24-7 to ensure the terms of the peace deal are adhered to. In the centre you can see that in some instances you can be five metres apart and you can look to your left and see Turkish forces and you can look to your right and see the Greek Cypriot National Guard positions. So. Armed? Armed, yep, yeah, yeah. Does that make it more volatile? There are some hot spots, and this is the area where we would dispatch our patrols out to. But that is effectively a war zone, this, this whole green line between the two sides. Yeah, yeah, there are tensions on the island, and I genuinely believe if the UN wasn't here, you know, we could see escalation between sides. I've been granted special permission to join Marina and Ryan on patrol here at the heart of the buffer zone, which cuts right through Nicosia City. Oh, wow. So we are now officially in the buffer zone. Yeah, so this is the buffer zone. These little lookouts here. Yeah, they're at firing positions. They've had to get used to having their every move watched by armed soldiers on either side of them, who in places are separated by just metres. This is Sphere Alley, the narrowest point of the whole buffer zone across all of Cyprus, 3.3 metres wide. We've got National Guard side. Yeah. And we've got Turkish Forces side. And there was a fierce fighting here. Despite the 1974 ceasefire, violent flare-ups continued here. This was probably the most aggressive part of the buffer zone, so each side would attach bayonets to poles and try and stab each other, hence the name Spear Rally. What, between the windows? Literally stand on a balcony? Yeah, through the balconies. After a number of fatalities, the UN brokered a demanning agreement and troops were withdrawn from flashpoints like this. Would there have been a point when the UN had to patrol through here when this was manned? Yeah. That would have been quite scary, I'd definitely. It's incredible to think that just a couple of miles from here, thousands of people are enjoying their holidays. This is our first manned position. A Greek position, presumably. Yeah, it's manned by the National Guard, and yep. they'll have one person on this position. Being kept just metres apart, a feeling of tension hangs heavy in the air. The sight of our camera crew has spooked the armed Greek Cypriot sentry behind me. So the man behind us is not happy. Um. But you're not, you're just, this is within your right? Yeah, yeah, so we're allowed to be here. Um, we've got approval. I don't want to antagonise things. No, no. It's forbidden to raise a weapon here, but his assault rifle is now clearly on show. Should we... Uh, yeah, yeah, we can. We'll, we'll move on now. And he was, is that Greek side or Turkish? Yeah, yeah, it's National Guard, yeah. Yes. The combined 65,000 armed forces on both sides are backed up by even more reservists. And in the last year alone, there's been over a thousand military and civilian violations across the zone. It's like an urban obstacle course, little bridges between roofs. Nicosia City was a sought-after inner-city business and residential area. Many were drawn to live and work in this cosmopolitan location. Wow, there's cars still here. To see what its residents left behind, we're heading to the Maple House complex a combined retail arcade with modern apartments above it. It's like going back in time in this room. Whoa, it's like a time warp. Look at the tellies. Yeah. 
Some of the some of the paperwork has got dates on it. There's newspapers in here. 1973, that's my year of birth. <laughs> it's not been touched. This is how it was left. This is how they fled. It's bizarre. These properties may look abandoned, but the people who were forced to flee them actually still own the deeds, but they're forbidden to return here. It's another hugely complicated and ongoing issue of the conflict, which in 1974 displaced an estimated 40% of the population. Refugees in a forced migration now scattered across the globe on a scale not seen in Europe since the Second World War. Wow. It's really haunting. I find it really sad seeing people's lives when they've had to up sticks and just drop everything and flee. And what's, what's particularly powerful here is that life kind of carrying on as normal just there. I can see the barbed wire. The geographical quirk. If these residents had been living 50 metres more that way, they might have been able to stay. You know, I think, I think this might have even been a children's bedroom. Little shoes. There's some railway track there and some, some wheels. It's like a time warp. People were forced to flee their businesses as well. Marina and Ryan are taking me to a Toyota dealership. So we come down here on patrols because these cars still belong to people and it's part of our job to make sure that no parts or the cars are getting stolen. Illegal trespassers are known to come here looking for souvenirs. One mile on the clock. Wow. So there's around 50 cars in here. Um, like you've spotted, all low, very, very low mileage. Yeah. Whoever left all this behind lost their livelihood overnight. I can't begin to imagine how difficult that must have been starting all over again with nothing. For a lot of people, this is an invisible kind of conflict. It's something a lot of people don't even know about, even just on the beach a short distance away. I'm wondering, your, your friends that you have back in the UK, in Yorkshire, yeah. have they got any idea about what this place is like? No, I, I, don't, I wouldn't have thought so. I know myself probably came out here a little bit naive to, to what I was coming into. It's also hard to explain to people back home. You come down places like this and into the flats that we've been in previously, it does give you a moment to reflect and sort of almost put yourself in the position of the people who have had to flee these buildings. It's, it's hard to fathom what they've actually gone through. It's just a surreal place. That's the understatement, Ryan. Nothing can really prepare you for the smell and the texture. I mean, this car smells like brand new leather. The windows are gone and there's dust everywhere, but Effectively, the owner of this just upped and left. You really were in a rush to leave not just your home, but your business. Listen to that clunk. They don't make cars like that anymore. It's impossible not to feel a sense of melancholy walking through all of this decay. It feels like I'm prying into people's homes and businesses, seeing the hopes and dreams of people I'm never going to meet. It's been the most surreal morning I think I've ever had. I, I wasn't expecting the scale of it. I, I wasn't expecting the intimacy. And this is a place that has been abandoned for the best part of half a century. And where does it end? The displacement, the loss of their homes, their possessions, their memories. So, so many refugees, and there still are. It's quite 
quite sobering. It started with my roommate. Cyprus is one of the most popular tourist destinations in Europe, but the communities here are at war. I'm exploring in and around the buffer zone that's divided them for almost half a century. Today, I'm traveling north into the Turkish-controlled side of the island for the first time. I'm heading to a checkpoint now to actually cross so I have to have ID, I have to have special insurance papers for the car. They're obviously um, quite skittish at the checkpoint. It's not known as a border. I'll see what they, um, what they make of me. It was forbidden to cross here until 2003. So Justin, you stop filming now. Do you need my passport? Prior to this, Turkish Cypriots were essentially stuck here. They could only travel to Turkey or possibly the UK, but that required special approval. Travel to any other country in the world or into the southern part of Cyprus was denied to them for 30 years. Thank you. And like that, I'm in northern Cyprus. You can definitely feel this has a different feel to the south. There are flags, huge statues. Wow. And dominating is that incredible mosque. The sun glinting on the gold. It's huge. This is quite something. This is the self-declared Turkish Republic of Cyprus, a de facto state that's not recognized by any other country in the world. To help boost the economy here, the government turned to tourism, controversially building both resorts and selling land for development with contentious ownership rights. If you speak to Cypriots, they all say that the beaches in the north are some of the most beautiful of the whole island. And one of the most famous was the resort of Famagusta. This was a place that attracted people from all around the world. This was the resort. Lots of it still lived in, but there is a section that has been entirely abandoned. And I'm going to join a couple, Takis and Thekla, they were a young couple living here back in the 70s and they were forced to flee. And Thekla has not been back since. The resort of Famagusta had just five hotels in 1960. By 1970, it had 35. The area also became popular with developers who found a ready Greek Cypriot clientele keen to purchase beachside properties here can't get over the scale. It's huge, this area. This was the main street of the town. If you had to make a presence in Famagusta, you had to walk in this road. Famagusta was a bi-communal town. When it was captured by the Turkish army, they were greeted by some cheering Turkish Cypriots many of whom consider this area, which they call Varosha, their ancestral lands. It's been sealed off since the war, but recently was controversially reopened as a deserted resort for tourists to visit. Prior to this, Greek Cypriot exiles like Thekla and Takis were forbidden to ever visit their home which they were forced to flee along with 15,000 other Greek Cypriot residents. It's 
none of this is what I was expecting at all. I, I wasn't expecting a theme park of despair. Yeah. Because oh. this is all people's lost lives, yeah. like, like yeah. yourselves. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Thekla and Takis have lived displaced between the Greek mainland and southern part of Cyprus ever since but actually first met and fell in love here in 1969. This is the cinema, Hadjikambi cinema. It was a beautiful building. Did you ever go on a date to the cinema? Uh, yes, after we got engaged, we came, and everybody was wondering why we were together. <laughs> <laughs> you, did you keep it secret? No, just it was no, the first days, but I and the people didn't know. A small town, everybody yes. knew everybody. And so, when they saw us together, what are they doing? <laughs> so you had to be careful. <laughs> they were married later that year, and they bought their dream home, a beachside apartment, soon after celebrating their wedding party. Oh, my God. Look at the Colton Mariana Dikes. I don't believe it. That is the hotel we got married. This hotel over here you got married yes, in? Yes. We had a nice reception. It belonged to my brother, and uh, he named it after his wife, Marianna. The Golden Mariana. Golden Mariana. For us, it's a torture, because we can watch our homes and places that we have so many memories, like this one, from a few meters away. And you cannot go in. Does and it make you angry? Very angry. Do you remember which each shop was? Of course. Pianos? No, that no. is no, Pano, Panos, Panos Panagiotopoulos, Panos, Panos, Panos, Panos. A, a very famous yeah, very. Uh, toy shop. I used to come and buy toys for the children. You had children when you were here then, when you were living in Panos? Yes, there are two of them. How old were they? Three and one. Most of Thekla and Takis's close friends and family also made homes in Famagusta. Overnight, the war made refugees of them all. If you turn this way, about 200 meters away, it's my parents' home, and we are not allowed to go. We can't go there. No. no. It's a case of human tragedy for both Greek Cypriots and Turkish Cypriots. You were just trying to get on with your lives here quietly. Yes. And then war came to you. Yes. Thakla has not felt comfortable with returning here until now. We thought we were going just for one or two days. It was full of memories. It was full of photographs. It was full of nice things, paintings. Can I see your apartment? Yes. Where is it? Which, which direction? We go that way. This way. Thekla's about to see her home for the first time in nearly half a century. I feel almost a bit awkward now. It's such a big moment for Thekla. This one here? Yes. Uh, 48 years stolen of our life. Unbelievable. Look at the dogs. When we were a young couple, we made our first uh, house. One and a half year before the invasion. Brand new, wonderful. We don't have one photo of our uh, children when we were very young, uh, of ourselves, uh, of the life we had in this wonderful town. They, were, they were all left behind? Behind, everything. Do you think anything is still there in the apartment? Mm. To help us more, mm. let's go, let's on, go the on the other side. To the beach side? Yes. yes. Their apartment overlooks the beach with the building entrance on the street side. It's rather shocking that right below Takis and Thekla's living room, tourists are allowed to visit here. If you can see, uh, there is a bookcase. Yeah. It's, is that yours? Yes, yes. It was a bookcase that we didn't manage to remove. In July 1974, with war imminent, 
Takis was conscripted into the army, meaning Thekla was left at home with the children on the morning of the Turkish invasion. I thought that I will uh, send my children to the beach to play for a while. And myself, I was on the balcony to watch them that they were okay. And I look back, and from there, coming a, a bombing plane. And he was coming straight here. I started shouting to the children, oh my God, come in, come in. And suddenly he just stood up and he went. And uh, thank God he didn't use a machine gun, he didn't use a bomb. And he went and he threw it somewhere else. It was a terrible experience. I mean, I even say it now and I am I'm trembling from fear. I, I thought he would, he would kill my children. When you left, did you think you'd be back a few days later? Did, did you even lock up? I locked up and I still have my keys. You've got the keys? I have got the keys. Imagine to keep them 48 years in my drawer. I, I think I am a masochist. Or eternally hopeful. I don't know. And this is as close as we can get now. We yes. can't get beyond the, the fence. Bizarrely, the area has strict opening and closing hours, and we've been asked to make our way out already. I feel terrible, but that's the reality of this limited opportunity to come and see what was once your home. Imagine what that feels like. I bet you walked up and down this beach many times. Look at the water. I know, look how clear it is. You're gonna get your shoes wet. Never mind. <laughs> Just to feel this water. We really enjoyed our life here. It's important for other people to know the tragedy of uh, the refugees in Cyprus. Can I give you a hug? Of course. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I know how hard that must have been. Thank you, Ben. Everything about that experience was strange and surreal and really moving. They just all left. They thought they'd be back a few days later. She still has her keys. She brought them with her. Imagine what it would be like if someone just says, leave your home now, and you assume you're gonna be back a few days later. Nearly 50 years on, let's turn to this. Sorry, sir, you, you, can, you can do that, I'll move forward. They're really keen to, to close. I can understand why there is animosity, hatred towards the other side. And that's the tragedy of the Cyprus problem, is that this was once a bi-communal island. People lived side by side, but now it's all fences and gates. It's peak summer season here on the island of Cyprus. But away from these glistening beaches lies a vast, active conflict zone, which today I'm exploring with the UN, who patrol it as part of their peacekeeping mission. Cyprus really is such a mix of different nationalities, and that includes the UN peacekeepers here. I've already been out with the British task force, and now I'm joining the Argentines. Now, they patrol some of the rural areas of the buffer zone. Hola, buenos dias. Morning, okay. Diego. Nice to meet you. Hi, Diego. Hello. Hola, que tal? Hello. Right, we're out on patrol. Yeah. On the island, the combined armed forces on both sides outnumber the UN 60 to 1. And nowhere is the gap more noticeable than here, in Sector 1, where the Argentine team must monitor military and civilian activity across a huge 90-kilometre expanse, which is longer than many borders and just as hard to control. Wow, what a view from here. 
So what can we see, Diego? We can see both sides from here. Lefka. Lefka is and, uh, northern Turkish, Cyprus. Northern Cyprus, the copper mine behind us. That's, that's outside of that's the That's outside of Buffer Sun and in the south of the island. Yeah. Not only is this the largest area in the zone, but it's also the most lethal. It was littered with landmines. The UN must use specialist disposal teams to locate and defuse them one by one. They've already removed 27,000. Despite being banned by most countries in the world, they continue to injure and kill soldiers and civilians indiscriminately. Here they remain a present danger for local farmers. I'm looking at fields that look like they're being cultivated. Yes, they are allowed to uh, farm their lands, of course. I spent time within Nicosia where no one was allowed to do anything. Yeah. And yet here in the buffer zone, you've actually got farmers working yes. the land. The UN mandate is for them to protect civilians by keeping the peace and to try and restore the normal conditions inside the buffer zone and on the island. And it's encouraging to hear that this is starting to happen. Any idea how many people live and work in the buffer zone? Yeah, uh, around 10,000 between... 10,000 yes. people? That's a lot of people. Across the whole Across of the line? Across the whole line. So you have a lot of people inside the buffer zone. Having so many people return to the area has created unforeseen issues. Do you ever get trespassers trying to come through here? Yeah, yeah, uh, many times. We look for uh, unauthorized uh, farmers, uh, hunters. We have uh, hunters. Yes, hunters. Uh, Cyprus has a long history of hunting. Is it quite a challenging area that you have to patrol here? Yes, the terrain is difficult, so it's it's challenging to keep an eye on everything that happens inside the buffer zone. And there's no fences on the outside of it? No, no, no. There's nothing there to stop uh, people from getting inside the buffer zone. I think what's astonishing is just the size of this buffer zone. Having seen the very narrow parts within the city, where they literally reached across balconies and attacked each other, this is a vast, vast area. 10,000 people, I, I hadn't realised, actually work within it. I'm beginning to see the scale of the task that Diego and his team have. Due to its huge range and isolated location, the area has begun attracting illegal activity. All this is abandoned? Yes, all this is abandoned. Can we have a look? Yeah, we have. Claudia and Diego want to take me to see a ransacked village that's been repeatedly targeted. It's hard to control them because it's uh, derelicted, uh, but the idea is to avoid them to get into the houses. They took doors, uh, windows, but you still can see bottles, uh, ceramic pots inside the houses. It's quite sad, isn't it? It is. It is. This was someone's life. This was a family's home. And there are still, nearly half a century on, reminders of, of what was once a very happy, thriving place. The UN are here strictly on a peacekeeping mission. They can communicate with law enforcement around here, but any civilian law-breaking is actually the responsibility of the Greek Cypriot and Turkish Cypriot police. How many incidents do you have? Uh, we have 20, 25 incidents. Per what? Per uh, week. Per in week? The, in the easiest uh, season, uh, in the calmest one. When the busy season starts, we can get up to 50, 60 incidents per week. There is criminality here. Yes. I think one of the really surprising things about the buffer zone is there's no fence. There are areas within the city where, you know, you've got oil drums and sandbags, but actually out here, there's no delineation. So anyone could go in or go out. Exploring this remote area, 
I realized the almost impossible job the UN has here on the island. But the reality is that the buffer zone, like many conflict zones, is a breeding ground for criminals. I'm off to meet a guy who basically uses the buffer zone, the green line, to smuggle goods between the two sides of the island. What he smuggles, I don't know. How he does it, I don't know. But I've got some basic instructions to head to a little village. He doesn't want me to reveal the name, understandably. And I'm hoping to understand a little bit more about some of the opportunists like him who have used this extraordinary division of an island to make a form of livelihood. He's been in prison a number of times and is currently on bail for smuggling. He's keen to protect his livelihood and, fearing gang reprisals, has asked us to conceal his identity, alter his voice and not reveal his location. So how big is the smuggling in the buffer zone? Very, very big. Over here, you try to make your living. Our age weight, they're going to pay you, is 25 sterling a day. What you can do with that 25 sterling a day? Financially, the people, they are struggling. Do you feel that you were kind of forced to get into smuggling? I had uh, problems. I, had, I didn't have no choice. That's why I've done it. So what's the kind of breadth of things that are smuggled through the buffer zone? Whatever you think of. We're talking about cocaine, heroin, guns. Human smuggling? They, they, they, the biggest smuggling now at the moment, they are smugglers from here. They're smuggling the humans on the other side, passing them through on the other side. Yes, they do. Wow. It's incredibly distressing to hear that human trafficking goes on near here. But it's a reality that the Eastern Mediterranean is now the main route for people smuggling into the EU, mainly from sub-Saharan Africa or Syria and Afghanistan. Here, the criminal gangs often use the hive of activity between communities at harvest time to conceal their smuggling. Without giving your trade secrets away, can you kind of talk me through how you might cross through the buffer zone? There is a loophole everywhere, from, from Augusta to Lefke. All the smugglers, they do know all the roads, or the, uh, what you call it? The mountains? The mountains, on the places they are visiting. There is a earth road everywhere. You want to pass on the other side, you can pass it. Legal or illegal, you can do that, you can pass. Having spent a little bit of time with the UN on foot patrol, I've seen how many posts there are and positions yeah. from the Greek Cypriot side, the Turkish Cypriot side, and the UN in there as well. How on earth do you drive a truck through? Like I said, we know the times they do the uh, patrol. Mm -hmm. And that's it. That is easy part of it. Because we know the ground very well, more than them know. Sadly, I've been to many conflict zones where criminals continue to find a way around the law. Here, who have Turkish military, Greek military, UN peacekeepers, yeah. police forces, there's five or six different authorities trying to catch you. Yeah, but still the people, they do it. Do you think there's a lot of smugglers out there? There's a lot. It's a very big gun. And they do make it a lot of money. People smuggling? Yeah. There's a cruel irony here. The people that are being trafficked by criminal gangs are refugees, just like many Cypriot victims of this long, ongoing conflict. Match me if you can. Rimmel's Match Perfection Foundation. I'm now out of the Cypriot buffer zone 
and have crossed into the Turkish part of Nicosia City. So far, with all the people I've met, all the stories I've heard, you would feel that Turkey is the aggressor. But I'm aware that the story is much more complicated than that. So I've come up to northern Cyprus, and I'm going to meet a Turkish Cypriot family. I'm fascinated and, and want to understand their side of events. The family I'm about to meet were made refugees long before the war began. Their ancestral home is actually in the southern part of Cyprus, and Greek Cypriots now live in it. Hello, Sally. I'm Ben. Uh -huh. Welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for inviting me. What a beautiful home. Can you introduce me to some of your family yes. members? I can start with my aunt. <laughs> Hello. Uh, Hello. I'm Ben. Very nice to meet you. What's your name? Nial. Nial. Very nice to meet you, Nial. What a beautiful kitchen you have. Now I'm going to introduce you to my cousin. Ah, oh, hello. Daughter. Hello, I'm Ben. What's your name? My name is Sida. Sida, very nice to meet you. Hello. hello. How are you? What's your name? My name is Selda. Selda, very nice to meet you. How old are you? I am 11 years old. Oh, your English is really good. Do you understand everything I'm saying? No. Yes, you do. I think you're tricking me. No. Can we sit down and maybe you translate a little bit? Yes. It was forbidden to cross the buffer zone until 2003, meaning Zelda's family had to wait over 40 years to be allowed to visit their ancestral home. Do you remember the first time the border opened? İlk zamanlar hani ailemin yaşadığı yerleri görmek için gittim. Orada doğdular, büyüdüler. Hep bize anladılardı mesela küçüklüğümüzden belli. Orada yaşadıklarını, nasıl bir duygu içinde olduklarını böyle hissettim. Duygulandım. Onların yaşadığı yerleri görmek. Büyük bir sıkıntı yaşadılar. Tabii ki ama benim onlara karşı hiçbir kinim. Tabii ki yok ama çok şeyler yaşadığı için ailemin tabii ki. Zelda's parents' home was in Nicosia City, where the seeds of hostility developed just after Cyprus gained its independence from Britain in 1960. By 1963, Greek nationalists were actively engaged in a sectarian offensive against their Turkish neighbours. In a violent period that became known as Bloody Christmas, hundreds of Cypriots, mainly Turkish, were murdered. 25,000 Turkish Cypriots were forced from their homes. Within a year, both sides became embroiled in a vicious, decade-long conflict, culminating in the 1974 Greek military coup and subsequent Turkish invasion. So you had to flee the south of Cyprus for here, the north? Yes, I, I came here when the troubles start at Nicosia. In 1963, I have been shot by the Greeks. Shot by the Greeks? Yes. One from my hand, one my back, and one at my back here. Why were you shot? They have troubles in the Tima. So this is 10 years before the 74 invasion? Yes. Sevdet worked as the postmaster at the British-founded Cyprus post office until the conflict forced him from his home. Remarkably, he had to continue paying the mortgage for it. He eventually resettled and built this home here. Oh, wow. What have we got here? Turkish oh, coffee. Turkish coffee. Thank you so much. Thank you. Do, do you say cheers in, in Turkish? Afiyetos. Afiyetos. Afiyetos. Like bon appetit. Like bon appetit. Afiyetos. Thank you. London. You've, cappuccino. Oh, you've had a cappuccino in London. I think this is much better coffee, though. <laughs> the most sensitive questions is obviously about the invasion in 1974. I'm, I'm wondering what, what you all made of that. We had a civil war. The authority here couldn't stop it. They led everyone to kill each other. So that's how Turkey came to Cyprus to stop uh, the civil war. <laughs> O kadar güzel geçirir ki geldiler şeyler Yunanistan'da <gülüyor> She is getting bit uh, emotional. Why do you get emotional when you think about it? We were living together uh, in peace uh, and then everything uh, changed. My wife and I we are 84 and 
83 years old. We work in three government. One in British, Cyprus, and now Turkish. Turkish Republic of North Cyprus. Three government. And if you had to pick just one of those governments again? The British. Because under the British, Turkish Cypriots and Greek Cypriots lived side by side, yes. happily, by communally. Yes. Mm -hmm. Do you think there will ever be a unified Cyprus? I don't think so. I don't think so. I don't think so. To find a solution, it, it will take another 50 years. Because one side say this, the other side say this. How they will find a solution? Does it sadden you that things changed so dramatically? Unlike his auntie and uncle, Sally never experienced living a bi-communal life. But the opening of the crossings in 2003 began to change all of this. He's a professor of ecology, and he now works alongside Greek Cypriot academics in the south protecting natural habitats in and around the buffer zone. After we started to work together, we realized that we have the same interest, which, uh, which is nature. No one is uh, better than the other. We have to, to cooperate together in order to find solution, at least for environmental problems. So, and this is true for other things. I'm wondering how you as a family identify yourselves. Turkish Cypriot. What does it mean to be Turkish Cypriot? It's a belonging. The land owns me and I'll own the land. My land, our land. Is this yes. a happy place? Yes, very happy. <laughs> <laughs> Sally's auntie, Nial, wants me to take a memento of Cyprus back to London. It depicts the island as it was before the war. Cyprus. Cyprus. It's Cyprus. It's, it's a, a map of the whole, it's the tray of the whole of Cyprus. Yes. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. That's beautiful. They were being very careful with their wording, but they were effectively justifying that Turkish invasion in 1974. And they were justifying it because without them, Turkish Cypriots may have been wiped out. And that's the first time I've kind of heard that side of the perspective, because up until now, most of the Greek Cypriots have seen Turkey as the aggressors. But for this family, they were the saviors. But with all the blood spilt into the soil, how can these two sides ever possibly reconcile? Surely this war can't be doomed to go on forever. Especially since they all once lived happily side by side. Match me if you can. Rimmel's... I'm coming to the end of my time here. Today, I'm in the Greek Cypriot side of Nicosia City and on my way to meet a group of musicians made up of both Greek and Turkish Cypriots. I love seeing this bustling side of Nicosia. I'm actually going to meet a pretty famous band who sort of, they cross, they straddle this divided city to try and kind of bring peace. I love that. You must be who I'm meeting. Alex. Hello, Alex. Hey, how are you? Hi, Alex. You. Alex. Left Terrace. Left Terrace. Really nice to meet you guys. I'm fascinated to understand how you're using music to bring both sides together. So we went across this checkpoint. Can I help carry anything or are you guys got okay? It. Thank you got you. it? Yep. <laughs> the band may be bi communal, but to rehearse together, they have to cross the buffer zone that divides them. Okay, he's saying that we cannot film. So. Okay, yeah, we've got to. Yeah, we're uh, we're not we're not filming now. It's just carrying. Yeah. They have to pass through two controlled checkpoints, and have to present ID at each one. Something as simple as just walking down the street to get from one side to the other sounds like it's going to be simple, but it's not. 
It's not easy to have a band meeting then, no. having to pass the checkpoint. We try to have a coffee and it's never... Yeah, happened. of course, you can't even just say, let's meet down at the cafe. Left Terrace comes from a refugee family and started the band to help promote bi-communal art. So it's right here? Okay. Shall we go play? Yeah, we? Let's get cracking. All right, let's do it. The band called themselves Island Seeds and are currently writing an album about their experiences of working together within the divided community. Wow, that was great. You guys are sounding amazing. You put a big smile on my face. <laughs> cool. Yeah, that's good. I love that. This is the first time in this whole journey that I've been in a room with a whole group of young Turkish Cypriots and Greek Cypriots. And th there's no history, there's no worry, there's no antagonism. It's just hopeful optimism and creativity. I put a big smile on my face. The band have played together for four years, but admit it took time to trust each other. I was actually surprisingly moved listening to your music. But how do you break that stereotype that you may be brought up to believe that either side is, is in the wrong? I know, for example, Ulaj for like four or five years now, and it just took so much time to actually become closer, friends, play together, you know, because of this whole dense history of opposition. It's just people playing music together, and I've never felt anything beyond that. It's just as simple as that. Do you feel hopeful for the future here in Cyprus? I think we're, we're headed in the right direction. We are giving an example by what we're doing, by coming together and by making art, and that actually has something to say. But it's a good example for other people to see, oh, look at those guys. They're making something beautiful. They're both from both sides. Here's, here's to one common islanders. Yeah, here's to all of you. Cheers. Cheers. I found such energy and optimism with the whole band. And that doesn't mean things are going to change here. But it's how you deal with what you have spending some time with youngsters on both sides. They want to get on with their lives. Being here, I feel I've come to understand the cruel impact of the conflict that still resonates to this very day. It's a story all too common. Even now across the world, new conflicts are ongoing and more and more civilians are paying the price. Here in Cyprus, hundreds of thousands lost their homes and became refugees forever. Many forced to live abroad, most to the UK, where almost 300,000 Cypriots now live. Those that have stayed on have had to adjust to the status quo. Ultimately, it's just everyday, ordinary people trying to go about their lives, live in the places in which they were born, and having spent time with the Damos, Sally's family, and Thekla and Takis, you feel the emotion and you can't help but absorb it. I hope people take note of this story because not everyone's heard the Cyprus problem. And, and it's a really interesting perspective because, you know, both sides have sort of been failed. And I think I will take away lots of lessons from this tragic story that sort of divided a people that didn't need to be divided. Mm -hmm.